fellowship. Please stand if you wish and join us.
morning. We welcome each and every one of you to God's house this morning. Uh, we have uh, quite a few away and family and friends uh, on July 4th uh, vacation. We pray for traveling grace for all of them. Uh, we also look at some of the uh, announcements or things that are coming up uh, in our bulletin. Uh, and you can take a look there. Is there anything that we need to be made aware of uh, as far as the announcements in the board. Okay, as we look at uh, prayer concerns, uh, before we sing uh, Count Your Blessings, I'm hoping you will join us. I need to let you know I'm probably going to be away all summer long. My uh, uh, chosen activity, uh, busy time is summertime, so I'm going to be away a lot. So. But I'll be with you in spirit, and I'll see you soon. All right, please uh, join us uh, for a count your blessings.
this week and, and I'm not listen, I'm not at all trying to um, get into any politics because I must say politics and church don't go along sometimes it, it needs to but what I'm just saying that was uh, all and now all it was a pretty sad debate and um, so as I thought about that and thought about America and uh, you know, just not being, it seems like we don't agree on anything. And I know debates, hey, listen, throughout the years, debates have been like that, right? One 
horrible and all their ideas are stupid and the other one has great ideas and all their ideas are great. That's sort of the format of a debate, if you will, of how it all unfolds. But I really thought about America and just where we stand in America. Now, folks, I do believe that we still live in the greatest nation in the world. We have a lot of issues, and you don't need me to stand up and list those issues. You know what they are. But So I'm looking at four, uh, four things here uh, that could just sort of, I think, Need to be, we need to be reminded as Americans, but more than that, we need to be reminded as Christians. One is caring. You know, it's easy to be pessimistic in this world and also to criticize. But in Philippians 2, 4, it says this, not looking to your own interests, watch this, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. That's a challenging one, right? You know, especially in America and in our world, and, and sometimes even between Christians, if you don't agree with me, I despise you. So it, it, we need to realize, Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now, I do still see this in America and in uh, the realm of Christianity and churches. We, we do a lot of good things for a lot, of, a lot of people. And usually when something happens to someone, people pull together. I mean, especially in our part of the country, uh, if someone's in need, folks just pull together. And uh, Christians do it. Non-Christians do it. They pull together overall to support one another. So we're blessed also to be living in a uh, society, especially in our society, where people really do care about each other. Now, in caring, we want to be clear about what we stand for. But we do care about everything. I wrote down, be sure we are clear on what we stand for, yet don't forsake caring for one another. It is not productive to be alienating others and creating more <coughs> divisions. Uh, someone don't believe like we do, it doesn't mean that you start believing like they do in order to uh, build a relationship. No, you stand firm on your conviction on how you feel. Uh, however, you still have compassion for that individual, and we have a lot of people in this world that are simply messed up. And dealing with issues that we would have never even thought about 20 years ago. Just unbelievable. All that's out there. But it is not moving to a being hateful towards any of those ones or necessarily pointing fingers, but it's out of love and compassion and caring for individuals that we try to point them to Jesus Christ. Not through what, there is no, well, there's debate on presidency and things like that. <clears throat> Sometimes they, they'll say after the debate, well, they didn't talk about this, this, and this. You know, there are so many problems out there it would be foolish of us to think that whoever we vote is will take care of all the problems, right? But we need God in America. And we need God in our communities. We need God in our churches. God in our lives. God in our houses. That's what we need. We need God in America again. And that's the answer. The complexity of the issues in America uh, is cannot, it, they can be overcome, but it will not be by any man but by the one named Jesus. When Jesus spoke in John 8, 12, he said this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Will have, will have the light of life. 
and maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's from the perspective that I look at it, but I see a lot of people that don't have the light of life in their lives. They're searching. They don't know that it seems like they're, they're very often pointing fingers at others and saying, I need to take care of myself. And it is, in fact, sad. Matthew 5, 16 says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, when I think about this, how uh, nobody's ever going to call me and say, listen, how are we going to fix America? Or why don't you run for president? Or I couldn't pronounce any of the, those leaders from the foreign nations or the foreign nations. So I, would, um, I wouldn't get any of that right. They asked me, I would say Jesus is the answer, but really what I'm uh, looking at here is that we cannot as individuals make all the changes that is needed in America, in our communities, and in homes, and churches, and all that. It must begin with us, so we take care of us. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good deeds, and then here it is, and glorify your Father in heaven. Why is that individual different than what we see in society? It's Jesus. And through just spending some time uh, with one of us, listen, none of us are perfect, you know, I say that every time. One reason I ran out of time because, you know, I, I struggle like everyone else. But none of us are perfect. But wouldn't it be good to make a, a little difference in someone else's life? I tell you what, I, I know that, and, and Liz is the same way, when we can try to help and make an impact in someone else's life, we are never any more happy. And the real blessing is, is when they don't know about it. Isn't that right? Oh, man. Because you, you, I mean, we celebrate with each other because we just want to encourage each other like that. But really, we celebrate with God. And it's just a, it's just a wonderful time. God, I'm being about your business. Caring loves the light in which freedom lives, and one can draw from that light, the result of which is growth in self-respect. And I think that is one of the major issues in our world today, is people have little self-respect, and they react with anger oftentimes. Second of all is contemplating. What is possible in our lives and the lives of others around us? To have a clearer understanding of where we stand as a nation, a commonwealth, a city, a church, and from that understanding, provide a vision. The Bible talks much about visions. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And that's one reason as far as, uh, again, I said we you get down on the future, we think of our nation or for our kids or grandkids, things like that. But we hold on to these truths that we know that are truths from the Bible. I know the plans I have for you. Hallelujah. I God, I'm not sure... I know exactly the plans you have for me, but you got it down pat. And in that, I'm at peace. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. He that keepeth the law, happy is he. And that's the King James Version. Now, uh, I like that. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, and then happy is he. Now, stay with me. You know, I got 
kooky mind sometimes. <laughs> if you don't believe me, do ask Leah. She'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> duck, when you ask her. But I mean, no. Um, the King James, but he that keepeth the law. And you almost think in King James would say, happy death is the thing that thou gettest. And it can come to you within your own body. You know, right? I'm not saying this, guys. I'm not cutting down the King James Version. It is a beautiful version, especially if you read it out and you can get all the THs and all that. It flows. It's poetic. So I'm not doing that. Don't, don't fuss at me about that. If you want to fuss at anybody, see Daniel. He, uh, <laughs> he came out with that new King James Version Bible that uh, he had a part in writing. So now what I'm saying is that what grasped me, and this, this is odd, I mean, I, I was thinking about knowing that uh, we have to have the vision of God, and the vision of God leads to successfulness and, and happiness, and it just says, happy is he. That's pretty simple. I, I think that's some of my grandkids would say. Happy is me. You don't, you don't say happy is me, right? How are you doing today? Happy is me. <laughs> We have, when we went to um, Florida to see um, Doty many years ago, their, one of their youngest granddaughters uh, would say, when we get ready to go, all the body. Who's going? All the body. Well, she, she heard everybody's going. So when you got ready to go, all the body. You know, wouldn't it be different for the next two months that when we greet each other out, we go, happy as me, no matter what they ask you. You know, how's that corner of your toe? Happy as me. I like that. Happy is me. Number three, after contemplating, is conspiring. Now, that's an interesting word to use, conspiring. When you look it up to get the, uh, get the, uh, yeah, whatever you call that, uh, I heard it. Definition. Definition. Thank you, my love. <laughs> Happy as me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, happy as me. Yeah. I love it. She does that a lot for me. Make secret plans jointly to commit an unlawful or harmful act. Now, why in the world would a pastor use the word conspiring when the definition of it is make a secret plan jointly to commit an unlawful or harmful act? But look at this. Stay with me. Some of the similar words that I found was plot, hatch a plot, form a conspiracy, a scheme, a plan. I don't know what that one is. Um, collaborate, consort, maneuver. Work hand in glove. Be an accessory. And I like this one because I remember my, my mama saying this. Be in cahoots. That's almost, be happy, isn't it? That's almost happy as me. Um, be in cahoots. The conspiracy that we as God's people Need to conspire together to be in cahoots with one another to reach the others for Jesus. Folks, the media, the world, the highways and byways of life are doing everything they can to pull people. And there are places now, and you know it well, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. 
there's places now that if you mention Jesus or something in a workplace, or byways, highways of life, you're really being told to, if that works for you, okay, just be quiet. That don't work here. We need to be in cahoots. That is for the last breath that we have in us, and I'm not saying that you need to go down here and roll down your window and uh, shout it out. You don't need to go down and get on a, uh, a box and start preaching. God leads you to do that, do it. But we just need to be in cahoots. To listen, if you're around us very, very much, very often, you're going to hear something about Jesus. Either you're going to hear it or see it. You're going to see an action from us or you're going to see it in something that we say, something we react to. You're going to see it. Why? Because we are in converse with one another. That's what we're going to do. America needs that. And then the fourth and the final one is committing. Committing our hearts and all these sort of intertwine in, in, an inst, uh, uh, in a way to commit our hearts, minds, and energy. Your presence today represents, your presence here today represents you. And what you bring today is a gift. Now, See, I've always truly believed, and I believe most of you do too, that everybody, God has a special place in His kingdom and His ministry. There's something about your personality. There's something the way you interact with one another. There's something about things that you just love to do. There's something that God desires to use all people. That's your gift. And it's simply in saying that the gift that you give to the Lord to remind, I don't say remind the Lord in prayer, but remind ourselves, God, here I am. Use me today in that situation. And I know I talk a lot about Liz and I. We, you know, I'm the preacher and I stand up and talk. But when we go out somewhere, Liz is much more the talker than I am. And we go out to shop or something, and I probably have said this before. It's one good thing about getting older because you don't have a clue what you said before. This may be brand new, brand new to me. So, um, now we'll go out and. You know, man, when we go to get something at a store, don't we go to get something at a store? I want this one item. I'm going to go in. I'm going to pick it up. If they don't have it, no, I'm not going to do another shop. I'll just come back in the next six months and get it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Amen. I heard that. <laughs> Let's take up another offering for that one. Um, but my wife always gets into a conversation with somebody else. Use it without fail. Carol, I do blame you for part of the time. Um, but <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's different. I mean, and that's even a gift. Because I, I can hear somebody go, oh, thank you. And, you know, things like that. Thank you for helping me. And I'm thankful for goodness sakes, dear. And, and, and do you do this? Do you go to the store and say, you got 30 minutes? Well, I helped this lady in for 25 minutes, and I didn't have time to look for anything. So I guess so. And I used to say this, as soon as Carol starts feeling better, you guys need to get out and go shopping. Because it's not working with me. So anyway, I know I've said that before. I want to read a lesson that was written because I believe we can learn a lesson from the experience that Dr. Rachel Naomi Riemann, the psychologist and physician, had when she shares 
the two days before her mother's 80th birthday. And this is what she says. I asked her how she wanted to spend the day, and she said, isn't there an, um, well, to ask her how she wants to spend the day, and she said, I want to climb to the top of the Statue of Liberty. And I said, isn't there an elevator? And my mother looked at me and said, I want to climb the stairs. She lived in New York City for almost 80 years, but she had never had this experience. She clearly remembered her first view of liberty uh, she had when she sailed into the New York Harbor from Russia. She had been five years old then. Now, of course, she had a severe heart condition and there were 342 steps at the top. I can uh, attest to that. Uh, she was saying, I attest to it because we went up it. I realized we could do it in three or four steps at a time. Resting in between, we would take her nitroglycerin and simply allow all day. When I proposed this to mom, she was delighted. During the six hour ascent, I had many misgivings how I had gotten into this crazy thing, climbing the Statue of Liberty with an 80 year old woman with a severe heart disease. But it was her wish and she continued a few steps at a time she may have had uh, enigma, but she also had iron wheel. I think half of New York must have passed us on those sta stairs. Finally, unbelievable, we were six or seven steps from the top as we stood there taking what must have been our 300th time out. My mother uh, said, the last few steps between her and her goal within resent with resentment why she said couldn't we have done these first steps done these steps first i'm sorry i misread that the last few steps between her and her goal with resentment why she said couldn't we have done these steps first uh, those last ones Rachel concludes the story in a very powerful way that touched my heart. And thinking of this story, now I remember all the times that I too have resented the climb. The amount of living needed to gain the precious understanding, to know how to live well and how important it is in the struggle for freedom from the old ways, not to be limited by style or self-expectations or to worry about what others think, to be willing to do the really important things any way you can, even uh, three steps at a time, to be willing to do the really important things any way we can. To, again, reiterate the really important things, to do them any way I want to close with this verse, a very familiar passage, but I think well-fitting. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, We thank you for our nation. We pray for our leaders, not only in the, in the White House, but also in the state capitol and our local community leaders. We pray for guidance and directions. We pray, Father God, that, that you will be part of all the decision making Lord, we also pray for our church and we pray for ourselves. But Father, it's got to begin with us. But Father, in that we are well pleased. So Lord, today, 
we thank you for our church, our home, our church family, those loved ones around us, those neighbors, for so much that you have blessed us with. And Father, this morning, we pray, God bless America. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. You can stand if you would like.